Okay, good mid-morning, I think. It's afternoon in Texas, so. Actually, it's really early in the morning in Texas. I am going to use this uh, handheld mic uh, for as long as necessary. They're trying to work on the other mic. So I apologize if I set this down while I'm doing demonstrations and it makes a loud noise. Uh, my name is Bob Ward from the Microsoft Corporation. You might have attended already some of these talks, so I'm not going to go through the incredible spiel of who I am and how long I've been at Microsoft. I've just been at Microsoft a really long time. Uh, I am a principal architect. Um, everything that I'm going to be showing you today and in any of my talks, uh, I am providing to the conference uh, here. But if you, for whatever reason, can't get it or have an issue, you can always email me at bobward at microsoft.com. And I'm happy to provide you anything uh, of the demonstration scripts or the slides that I'm working on. So today's topic is inside SQL Server wait types. I would say today's session is fairly deep, uh, maybe not as deep as uh, what you are expecting. I'm doing another talk uh, after lunch called Inside SQL Server Latches, and that's a very deep technical session, uh, which is a, a certain type of wait type. So, when I talk about latches today in the weight type section in this talk, it may not be as deep as uh, what I'll go into this afternoon. <clears throat> so first of all, let's talk about what is a weight type. You know, what is this thing? So in a galaxy far, far away, which is a reference to Star Wars, um, if you look over the logo over there, that is actually the box logo for SQL Server 4.21 back in the 90s. Uh, we, ha we, being Microsoft developers and support, had this need to help find bottlenecks in the code or bottlenecks for apps. And so we created this concept called a wait type. And early on, all we had were waits for locks, I.O., and network in the very early versions of the server. And we didn't really document this stuff very well. Um, so over time, we added a bunch. In fact, we kind of went what I would call overboard on the amount of wait types we would add. And as we did these wait types, a lot of times it was for our own internal purposes. And so we didn't do a really good job of sitting down and documenting every single wait type that we put into the code. And the name of the wait type is really up to the developer in some cases, which you probably can see as you look at some of these. And in fact, if you look down here in the, in the right-hand corner, in SQL Server 2008, there were 485 of these wait types, now exploded to over 700 in 2014. Now, as I go through these different weight types in today's talk, I'm going to categorize them in different types. So for example, a resource weight type is where you're waiting on a resource. I.O., network, threads, memory, etc. A synchronization weight type is something we do internally to make sure we're synchronizing access to a resource, but it's not necessarily that you're waiting on a resource like I.O. or network. And those are things like lock, lockers, locks, latches, and others. So synchronization is all about making sure that we provide some sort of consistency or thread safety. A forced wait type is something where our code forces ourselves to wait for a specific purpose. And we'll talk about a concept called yielding later and a specific wait type for it. You have something called an external wait type, which is a concept called preemption, which we're going to do specifically to ensure that we don't avoid any scheduling problems with our system. And then finally, a concept called a queue wait type, which is really more about what happens for background tasks. And I'll talk about that as well in the talk. So I thought you might find this diagram interesting about how does a wait type actually work. And let's use the example of a lock, a lock that you need in your application. So a very typical lock for an application to get is a shared intent lock on a resource. Shared intent lock for a table, for example. And it looks like something like this and the wait type, LCK, underscore M underscore IS. You've probably seen this all over the place. Common for a select statement. So what happens is, if we try to acquire this lock resource, we might have a conflict because somebody else owns a lock that's not compatible with that. In the code, if we detect there's a conflict in the lock manager, we know we need to wait until this resource becomes available. So here's how it kind of works internally. We set up this class in the code called an SOS wait info structure. Not that you need to understand the details of what an SOS wait info structure is, but it's something that we use commonly in our code all across the engine because we rely on SQL OS to help us do this waiting system. And we pass into this class this wait type 
this LCKMIS, that's the weight type. And it's important that we do that because SQL OS is going to be responsible for producing the data that shows you weight types, weight times, signal wait times, wait resources, et cetera, et cetera. So all over the server we use this class, any place in the code, to tell SQL OS this is what we're going to wait on. So we set up this class, and then this is a routine that I'm going to show you in a second under a debugger. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you that I like to use the Windows debugger in my talks. So if that's something that scares you, now you can run out very quickly, uh, maybe you attend another talk before it's too late. So we call this routine lock owner sleep, and that tells the lock manager we're going to wait on a resource. And what we do is we use a SQL OS, this SQL OS system, we use it, its event concept to wait on this lock resource. Now why do we do that? Why is it important to use SQL OS's event wait? Because SQL OS has designed a system that when you wait on a resource, you're very smart about scheduling in this non-preemptive fashion. And what happens is, is that when we go wait on this lock resource, we want to make sure that we go wake up another worker on our SQL OS scheduler so it can start running. And so what happens is, is that we use this Windows call, this is a Windows API call, signal, object, and wait, and we signal the person that's runnable on our scheduler, and then we go wait on our resource. So this is a basic flow of how we actually go and wait on a wait type. So anyways, that's the basic flow of how you actually wait on a wait type inside SQL Server. And it's very important that we use SQL OS to do all this waiting so we can, we can properly schedule ourselves and wake up other people running on the system. If when we waited for a lock, we simply called directly into a Windows call to wait, we would basically not let anybody else run that's on what we call our SQL OS scheduler. So let me stop for a second and show you a demo in a very simple lock scenario. and what this kind of looks like on our debugger. You probably use the Windows debugger all the time in your job, right? Yeah. All the time. Okay, so I've got SQL Server running. Let's make sure we got SQL Server running. Nope. Yeah, it's already started. By the way, in the, in the US when I've done talks before, uh, I'm not suggesting you do this, but people like to get on Twitter. <laughs> And, and comment about when I'm in the middle of my talk. Like in the middle of the talk, somebody gets on Twitter on their phone. And, and the joke in the US is that Bob Ward is using the debugger. Everybody look out, you know. <laughs> I find that humorous. But So I've got this script here that I'm going to run that just creates a database and inserts some data into another fun name that I've created for a sports team. And then I'm going to run a script that is going to simply delete some data, and try to insert some data. And it's blocked. It's waiting on this lock resource. So what does this look like inside the server? <coughs> well, using public symbols, I'm going to load up the debugger, the Windows debugger, put in my symbol path, and attach to SQL Server. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to dump out the call stacks with using this command, unique stack, just dumps out all the call stacks that are unique in the system to see what this looks like. And if I scroll up here, here's what I'm going to find, this sequence, which very much represents what I just showed you in, visually. You can see here, here is the routines, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Here is the routines uh, that I just mentioned. LCK lock internal means let's just try to go get a lock. Lock owner sleep says I've got a conflict, I need to wait. Right above it is this using of this SQL OS, oh man, sometimes, zoom it, I don't do a good job. Okay, this is this SQL OS event that I told you about we're using, okay? And if you look up here, here is finally this call to signal object and wait. And notice right below it is this call to this switch routine. So this is the flow of how we do things in SQL Server. If you want to wait on a resource, the first thing you have to do is go tell somebody else who may be ready to run, you need to go run while I'm waiting on a resource. Otherwise, we would kind of use up the system and no one else would be able to run. A very common process that we do inside SQL. You wait for a resource, 
use CQLOS events to do that. CQLOSO events are smart enough to understand I need to switch to somebody else and wait. Now what will happen here is when my resource, my lock resource is available, the person that owned the lock resource will take my worker that was responsible and put me on a list called a runnable list. Okay? And then when whoever is running on my scheduler, he'll wake me up to run. I can now come off this signal object and wait call and I can proceed accordingly past this lock owner sleep call. Now, uh, based on the repro I just showed you, what would you expect that the other thread stack would look like inside this dump? Like what else should I see inside this, uh, this call of all these worker threads and stuff? What, what would be the one that owns that lock I'm waiting on look like? Does anybody have any idea? Those of you in the, in the pre-con that attended it, you should know this answer. Or else you failed. <laughs> so there is no call stack for the guy that owns the lock because he ran his query, opened a transaction, and he completed. So there is no current worker thread owning the lock that's running. It's just my session that owns the lock because I opened a tran, I ran a query, and then I'm not currently running anything. So you won't see him anywhere here as actually running because he's an idle worker and the session actually owns the lock. I don't know if I use the debugger anymore. I'm, I'm not sure if I do anymore. I know in latches I'll use it a lot. So, Okay, that's just the basic flow of waiting on a resource. <clears throat> okay, so I thought this slide would be very interesting for you. I actually have done this wait type talk several different times in the US and I added this as a new slide because I've had some people ask me, well, when do we set the wait type and the last wait type and how does the wait time get calculated and so forth and so forth. So consider these dynamic management views where you can see evidence of metrics of waiting. So first of all, when the worker goes suspended, like when I'm waiting on a lock, suspended is the state in the task. What happens is, is that the, there's a start time set for this worker thread who's associated with the task. And you can see that start time in DMOS workers. It's like, hey, I'm going to start waiting at this point. Then what we also do is we establish the wait type and wait resource in these two DMVs, exec requests and OS waiting tasks. So when you're suspended, you can go into those DMVs and you can see what is uh, the actual wait type and wait resource. Now, you're only going to see the wait type and wait resource in exec requests if it's an actual request. It's a task bound to a worker. Here's the part that is interesting. When we do this, we set the last wait type equal to the current wait type. So whenever you're waiting on a resource, they will always be the same. Okay, and I'll explain when the last wait type will look different than the wait type here in a second. And then we're going to increment the wait type wait count inside this DOMOS wait stats DMV. So this is the concept of suspended and how I update these DMVs. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned the fact that after you are waiting on a resource and somebody wakes you up or somebody puts you and says you own this resource, you go to this runnable state before you actually start running. Now, what happens then? Well, first of all, we mark the start time in the OS workers of when you're starting this runnable state. Okay? Second of all, and most importantly, we clear the wait type and the wait resource as shown in these DMVs. So once you go to this runnable state, you're not ready to run yet, but you're runnable. You don't see wait type and wait resource at this point. When you start to go in the running state, that's when we're going to record your overall wait time, your maximum wait time, if it's different than the current max, and your signal wait time in OMS wait stats. The difference between, <coughs> excuse me, the difference between going into this runnable state and going into this running state is called signal wait time. So if there's a problem on your system with maybe a yielding issue or a scheduling issue, this signal wait time could actually appear to be fairly high. And then here's the important point. The last wait type is not cleared when you go to running. So if you have a situation where you waited on a resource and then you started running, the last wait type will be the last wait type you waited on before you started running. And then let's say you waited on a different wait type the last wait type will now be set to the current one. So when you're waiting on something like a lock, 
you can't tell what the last wait type was before you waited in this resource. You only see it when you go into this actual running state. That's a difference between earlier versions of SQL Server, like SQL 2000, where we established this last, last wait type at a session level. Now it's at actually a worker level. So I thought you might find this interesting. Uh, I've had some people ask me, well, I'm seeing this signal wait time show up in my wait stats. How do I find the signal wait time for an individual query? Well, it's actually in the workers. At a given point in time, if you're running a given session and a request, you could actually go figure out the signal wait time for an individual worker by looking at this DMV. It's also important to note that in some cases, we're going to look at a particular wait type called SOS Scheduler Yield, where its waiting scenario is mostly in the runnable state, and therefore the signal wait time is really the majority of the wait time for that wait type. And so, how do we calculate the wait time when you look at, say, DM exec requests? You notice I didn't show in the diagram how we record the wait time in that DMV. That's because whenever you query DM exec requests, we calculate the wait time at that point in time that you query it. We're not going to sit there and continually increment a wait time. That would be expensive for your worker. So the way the wait time is calculated is we take the now value, what is the current time, and we subtract from the start time that the worker had to start with. And I, I'll show you uh, in a moment here in a demo how you could actually do that yourself by looking at these DMVs. You could calculate the wait time yourself. OK. So how do you see these wait types beside the DMVs I just talked about? Wait stats, requests, and waiting tests, I just mentioned these. Wait stats is historical, right, over time. <clears throat> Let's be very clear, if you didn't know this, this is actually something that's only in memory. So if you restarted SQL Server, you would lose that data. You could store it off and preserve it. You could use something like Management Data Warehouse, which preserves it. Exec requests and waiting tasks are a live state of what's currently running the system. Sys processes is a legacy uh, DMV, a uh, view, that you might can use. I don't really use this anymore, but some people like to. Extended events provide some tracing. I'll talk about that at the end of the talk. Management Data Warehouse and Activity Monitor provide a view of weights inside a tool perspective. And finally, there is a weight statistics counter inside Perfmon that you could try to go collect weights over time. So let's stop for a second and look at some of these DMVs. <coughs> Let me uh, stop these guys. So, you know, this, this type of query right here against exec requests may be something that you use all the time. And <clears throat> it's just showing the basics of the wait type, the wait time, the wait resource, and the last wait time. And we just talked about how we calculate that and how we store it, right? But here's what's more interesting for you that you didn't know. That in the workers DMV, you can actually get the wait started ticks I mentioned. That's when you start your wait. Here's when we start the resumed value. And then if you want to find out what is the now value to compare that against, you would use this DMOSS info DMV, MS ticks. So I've created an example query for you how you could actually use MS ticks to calculate the wait time without using the, the uh, exec request DMV. And you would just subtract these numbers and you effectively now have for a given worker session, here is the wait time. As I run this, you'll see in some cases if there are background tasks, they will continually increase. And I'm going to talk about in a later slide, why do background task wait types, wait times, seem to just keep going forever? And why do some background task wait times seem to cy cycle? We'll, ta we'll talk about the differences between those. But anyways, that's a way that if you wanted to find out exactly what the wait time was based on a worker, you could also do the same type of concept with the resume wait time. If you were concerned that a given uh, worker was spending too much time in this runnable state. This is just the old legacy sys processes. Notice that um, here, the wait type is a hexadecimal value. And you're like, well, what are those values? I don't remember hex values. Nobody knows these things. Well, the last, remember I said to you that when the wait type is set, the last wait type is equal to the, the wait type. So the way you interpret this is that this is actually equal to that. <laughs> 
Because if you're runnable, the weight type would be cleared to zero and you wouldn't see it. Like here's an example here of a weight type of zero and the last weight type is schedule or yield. And when I talk about that weight type, schedule or yield, I'm going to explain why is it in this type of a situation. <clears throat> this is a DMV to find out all the tasks that are waiting, only waiting. And the reason you might consider using this over DM exec requests is because you might have a situation where there's not enough worker threads to service all the tasks. So some tasks might show up in here that are not in DM exec requests. But this is just simply the same type of information, a wait type and a wait duration, or how long this has been waiting. And then finally, you probably use this. If you don't, you should become familiar with it, which is DMS wait stats. And I use, you know, I don't normally look at wait stats here without using a where clause, because DMS wait stats without a where clause is a dump of all the wait stats that we have. Remember, I said there were 700 of these things? It's a dump of all of that, regardless if there's any waiting or not. And so if you do a wait greater than zero, order by wait type, you could actually say, well, just tell me the ones that are actually waiting. And over here to the right is this signal wait time I mentioned to you. And then if you wanted to do something interesting, you could say, you know, show me all the ones that have been waiting for 10 milliseconds on average, or something like that. All sorts of different calculations you could do in your system. <clears throat> a lot of people believe that in performance troubleshooting, one of the greatest things you should do to troubleshoot a problem on your server is simply just look at wait stats. Just simply go through and see what the, t the highest type of weights you have on your system and do some analysis past that. And I think that's a good idea, provided waiting is your problem. <laughs> So it could be that you have a high CPU utilization problem that maybe you don't want to use just this. Although we'll talk about SOS schedule yield and why that could be an indicator of a CPU situation as well. And then <clears throat> if you didn't know this or not, you can use this SQL perf clear command to clear this dynamically. Because I told you that when you shut down SQL Server, we actually clear this out because it's only memory based. And this clear command applies to any of the wait stats, like latch stats or spin lock stats, et cetera. OK, for some of you, it's like, Bob, that's really basic. I thought this was going to be interesting. It'll get interesting. OK, let's go into some of the different type of weight, type, weight types. And we're going to start slow and get a little more complicated. So we talked about locks, LCK something, right? That's a synchronization type of lock. I don't call that a resource weight myself personally. Because the reason why you wait on a lock is to synchronize for application consistency, transactional consistency reasons, right? And it's almost always an application thing that you're looking at. Very rarely is this something that's you know, internal to SQL Server, although there are some examples of that, specifically if it's some sort of wait, a lock on a system table. Page latch and page IO latch are also synchronization wait types. <clears throat> Excuse me, although page IO latch we'll talk about in this discussion, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll talk about later in discussion on latches this afternoon, can indicate an inch, a situation with a resource like I.O. And so if you see like a page latch becomes something that is a bottleneck for you, it's something in some sort of hot page scenario. A page in your server that's being contended a lot, good example, that is TempDB. If it's a page I.O. latch, it's always typically some sort of I.O. delay, although notice you have this new concept called resource governor IOP cap. You can do a resource governor IO cap in your system now, and this number could appear to be slightly inflated and may not be a disk issue if you're using something like IO governance. And then finally, ASIC network IO is definitely a resource wait because you're waiting on network. And that's actually what this wait type means. The way that works on our server is very, very simple. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we're sending results back to a client application, when we send the result over the network with an actual network call, we mark that wait type. And then when we've acknowledged that the client has received the result, we clear that wait type. So it's pretty simple. If you send results off to a client and it takes forever to process it because of the application or network, you will see a high wait time there. And of course, the problem that you may have observed in your system is you could be holding on to locks or resources while this is occurring. So it's always a network or an app issue. I've never seen it not be that. <clears throat> and then some approximately 50 of the weight types that show up in the engine are made up of these different ones. The reason I have LCKXX, of course, is that there's different types of locks, shared intent, exclusive, et cetera. 
So some weights may not be a bottleneck. The miscellaneous weight type should be called not waiting. <laughs> now, why do I say that? Because we, the, the weight stats themselves, I don't know if you know what an enum, enum is or enumeration and C coding, but the weight stats are this enumeration of just this table and code that we have. Well, every enumeration typically starts at zero. Well, zero means miscellaneous. <laughs> so probably zero should have been like no waiting. So anytime you look at a DMV, and you see the weight type equals zero, the last, excuse me, if you have a weight type of like null, the last weight type probably says miscellaneous because that's what it means. Background task weights have these kind of flavors. Here's some example of these. In the books online, we call these Q weights. <clears throat> Why do we call these Q weights? Well, here's an example for the log manager. The log manager Q weight means it's a background task that waits on a queue of work to be done to write out log records. So that's the wait type we call it to indicate we're just waiting on a queue for somebody to give us work to do. Well, I think lazy writer sleep, it's a bad term to call it a queue wait because that's not how lazy writer works. In fact, we call it sleep because that's what lazy writer does. It sleeps for one second, wakes up, does work, sleeps for one second, and so forth and so forth. And I'm going to show you in a second what you're going to find is if you have a true queue wait, the wait time is going to accumulate pretty large over time until there's work to do. If you have a timer or a sleep type weight, you're going to see a cycle of weights. You're going to see it increase and go back to zero, and increase and go back to zero, because that is an indication of it waking up based on its timeout value. And then finally, CLR auto event is just normal for SQL CLR. That's not something that indicates there's actually a bottleneck. <clears throat> so I wanted to show you just briefly this query so you could see this behavior of background tasks. <clears throat> and I've got this in the notes of the slide in this particular case. And so I'm just, you know, being very canonical here and using this uh, join with sessions because is user process equals one uh, is in indicative of the fact that, um, excuse me, this should be zero, sorry, uh, indicative of that to the background process. So if I look at this, and I go over and look at my wait times here. You'll notice for some of these uh, wait times that they're very large. And in some instances, they're actually not so large. Like here's Lazy Rider Sleep, that's 165. And if I run it again, I'm going to notice here that it's 663. But it's, it's never going to get above more than one second. If you keep polling this forever and ever, this number will never grow, 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 and grow. It's because of the fact that, and then here's another one, request for deadlock search. Our deadlock monitor wakes up every five seconds to look for deadlocks. So that number will never be any greater than five seconds. Whereas a queued based thing, like in this particular case, this K source wake up, or actually what's a better, this is a better one, SB server diagnostics. Nope, sorry, that's not a better one. Checkpoint, sorry, that's a better one. Checkpoint is based on a queue. So a checkpoint has a queue of work to do to checkpoint database pages. And so you see that number is extremely high. And if I have no checkpoint work to ever do in my system, this number will just grow and grow and grow and grow until finally there's some work to do and it'll go back down. So I've had some people look at wait stats before, wait types, and say, oh my gosh, there's this wait time going crazy in my system. And I'm, my first question is, is it a queue wait type or a background process that you shouldn't even be worried about? Okay. Well, let's dive into a couple of wait types that are probably controversial in the sense that people, I think, have some misconceptions of what they mean and what ramifications are to your application. One of them is called CX packet. And CX packet, I call a synchronization wait because that's exactly what it's used for. It's used to synchronize work across parallel workers. All this wait type means, if you ever see this, is you have a parallel query, period. Okay. We do not put CX packet weight up because of a bottleneck. That's not why it's done. It simply indicates there's some coordination going on between parallel workers. And so the first question I ask somebody if they see this weight type and they're worried about it is, do you expect to have parallel queries on your system? By the way, an index build on a CPU system could use parallel query or even check DB, so that's possible. But maybe you don't see a lot of them, you just see, excuse me, maybe you see a lot of these coming up. So if you don't expect parallel queries, you maybe should look into the fact that you have some running. 
The next question I ask is, do you have high wait times? If you've got CX packet waits that show up as a certain count, but the w average wait time is very low, maybe you don't care. Maybe it's no big deal in your system. There's also a wait resource value that is actually in the most waiting tasks, which I'll show you in a second. And that actually can show you the coordination between parallel workers. So high wait times just mean this. If you get a high wait time for CX packet, it just means you have a long running parallel query. And when you have this scenario, you're going to go need to look at the tasks involved in the query or the request to figure out maybe what's going on. And the number one thing I do when somebody is looking at this is I say, go look at the tasks and tell me which one is not CX packet wait. We'll show you an example here in a second. And so you might have some tasks that don't have that wait, and it could be another wait that is the problem. And we're going to see an example here in a second for that. So what should you do? You may not need to do anything. If you expect parallel queries for whatever reason in your application, and you're not seeing high long wait times, and you're not having a performance problem, my recommendation is, is to not call Bob. Well, maybe you can. We'll talk sports or something, but maybe we'll say these kind of things. You really need to worry about this. However, I believe parallelism is often an indication sometimes of a query, op query tuning opportunity. Because the server, in many cases, for let's say a non-index build or something, may choose a parallel plan because it thinks it's the best way to fastest run your query, but there may be situations where there's a tuning opportunity that a non-parallel version of your plan could be even faster. Not always the case, but it's possible. You may decide that for whatever reason, <coughs> um, you need to reduce the parallelism of a given query to make it run faster or to avoid issues on the overall server. And so, you, of course, you have this max stop hint at an individual query level. And then finally, you might consider modifying the max degree of parallelism value. We actually have, a, and when you get this deck, you can look at this link. We actually have some CSS guidance for what might be an optimal value to set for max degree of parallelism. It's a fairly complicated uh, piece of advice because there's a lot of factors that go into play of what is the optimal value. One comment I have here is that don't panic if you see this problem. And please, please do not think immediately, I need to set max degree of parallelism to 1 to avoid issues on my server. That should not be your immediate reaction. Having said that, if you work with CSS and we think parallel queries are consuming everything on your system, we may ask you to set that value in a critical situation to get the server stabilized. That's very possible. And then when I did this talk in, let's see, when did I do this talk in the US? 2000 something. Maybe you know the, the name Adam, Adam Mechanic, who's a very colorful and opinionated person. I love him, he's a great guy. He came up to me afterwards and he goes, I am so in disagreement with this slide. <laughs> I'm so mad at you, Bob, for saying this. I'm like, why? He goes, well, on OLTP systems, he thinks that should be set to one. Because in an OLTP system, he doesn't want any query running that could need parallelism, maybe some aggregation query, that consumes too many resources that OLTP type queries need. So that's just something I've seen commented by the community. It's not necessarily my personal opinion, but I've actually seen that comment before. My opinion is, Parallelism is a feature of this product. And by you setting it to one, you're effectively turning off this feature. So I am never going to tell you that you permanently need to run with that value. I'm going to try to find some reason of why, if you're running with a value other than one, is it causing a problem on your server. <clears throat> Let's stop for a second and look at an example of a parallel query. Okay. A very simple example. We don't see anything. Yeah, I'm going to duplicate the screen here. I'm just getting set up. Thank you, though. Mention it any time because, and by the way, just to let you know, I'm switching this way because in presenter view for PowerPoint, you can see some of your notes. But unfortunately, you have to duplicate your screen to get back to where you're showing the demos. OK. So I'm going to bring up this DMV. Okay. So this is uh, me looking at exec requests to say, show me all the requests that are user requests where the wait time is zero. Nobody's waiting at this point. And then if I look down here, this is a query to show me waiting tasks also for any user sessions. And if I run this, no one is waiting. I've got this query here for my colorful name for my football team. 
American football team. And I'm just going to run this count star after, I'm going to drop clean buffers because I want to make sure that I need to go read these pages from disk. So if I kick this off and I go look at my DMV, I want to show you what this looks like. Sorry, let me kick off the entire thing. So you're going to notice here something interesting. Number one, notice that the result of exec request has one row called CX packet and a wait time. That's it. It has just the one row. So you don't know the execution of all the tasks for the parallel query by seeing it just exec requests. You don't know much. And in fact, that's what people do. They call me and say, I've got a high wait time for CX packet. Ah, what do I do? And my first question is, go to the waiting tasks DMV and look down here and show me the different tasks that make up this and what is the wait type that's not CX packet. Okay? And you'll see in this example here, there are three tasks that have a wait type of page IO latch. Okay? And you'll notice they have a resource description, which is the page in this case, but the CX packet one has this resource description. And there's various details of what this can be in this, um, in this resource description. What's important to note here is this node ID. This node ID is actually the node of the parallel operator in the plan. So if you run into a scenario where we're trying to see the coordination between operators going on in a parallel query plan, you can use this node ID to see that, and we'll show you that in a second. But in this particular case, what's happening is this task right here, CX packet, is saying, I'm the guy putting together all the data to go feed this off to the final result set, and I'm waiting for these other people who are waiting on an IO page IO latch. So in this particular case, the reason why this CX packet took longer is simply because I had to go read a bunch of pages from disk. And so if I run this again without drop clean buffers, this is going to run with a snap of my fingers because everything's in cache. One scenario I've seen from customers is this wait type will say async network IO. I had a customer say, hey, I was running a query, is running in parallel, ran great. All of a sudden I get high CX packet waits out of nowhere. I don't know why. I'm panicking. I want to set max stop to one. I'm like, before you panic, can you tell me what are the wait types in waiting tasks that's not CX packet? And he said, oh yeah, there's one guy sitting at async network IO for really long periods of time. I'm like, aha, you have an issue maybe in your application on your network where you're not consuming results that's fast enough, and it's just a sequence of problems. The per person producing the results to the client is holding up the rest of the parallel workers to finish the plan. So it had nothing to do with parallelism. It was really an async network I.O. problem. If, in the case of a non-parallel plan, it was async network I.O., it would show up here in exec requests. So he had to dig into the lower DMV to figure out the true nature of the problem. Now, if you ran a parallel query and inside DMOS waiting tasks, everybody was CX packet, right? It wasn't an actual waiting event. This could be a case where you just have a very long running parallel query that's CPU bound. And I'm telling you that I've seen both scenarios where that's perfectly fine, because that's as fast as we can run something, or there may be a query tuning opportunity. It could be the fact that there's an index design you need to look at, or something with about your query, a cardinality estimation problem, or something that could actually make it run faster than running in parallel. That's the basics of CX packet. So the number one thing I want everyone to walk out today of this room is that when anybody asks you, I went to this session and passed, and what did Bob Ward say about weights? Well, Bob Ward said CS packets or CX packet weights are not bad. That's what he said. So you can go off now and tell your friends that just because you see that weight type does not mean that there is a problem with SQL Server. <coughs> I want to show you real quickly here before I finish on this topic that for this plan, if you look at the estimated plan, and you hover over here to this node ID, you can see here, here is this node ID in the plan that reflects that what I showed you uh, in the wait resource for the CX packet wait inside the actual task. So you can, if you're looking at a particular uh, resource description for a task as part of a parallel plan, you can actually see the coordination between them by comparing node IDs. And if you look here, this is a gather streams operator, which is gathering all the results from the scan and feeding it off to the final count star aggregation. And so if it takes forever to go scan the data, then this is going to show up as this waiting scenario. 
So uh, if you want to dive into more about this, I highly recommend this paper by Craig Friedman, which is a link in your slides when you get the deck. Craig is a developer in SQL Server that has done a series of blog posts and papers about parallelism. And if you want to understand the different parallel operators, what's a gather streams, those kind of type things, he does an excellent job of describing how we decide to use parallel operators and why they're used in a parallel plan. So when you get the slide deck, you can simply click on this link. It'll take you directly to this paper from Craig. Any questions about CX packet weights before I move on? One of the number one things I wanted to ever, does, so let me just ask you a question. Did you already know all of this? It's like, ah, I already knew all this. Or does anybody think, okay, thank you, I finally understand a little bit more what this is about. Because every time I do this, there's at least one person that walks out going, I didn't know that. Thank you for explaining this. So please come up to me afterwards and say, thank you for explaining this. It'll make me feel better. Okay, let's move on. Doing pretty good here. Non-buffer latches. I'm not going to dive into deep into this because I have a separate talk this afternoon about non-buffer latches. But effectively, this latch scenario can be generic in the code. We can use this for thread synchronization, not just for pages. And when you see them, it appears as a latch underscore XX type scenario, as opposed to a page latch, which is a specific latch we use for synchronizing just for database pages. And then you see these in latch stats. The weight type and the weight resource will actually be the name of the latch, the latch class. And the weight resource will show you both the last latch latch class and the address of the latch class, which I'll show you this afternoon why that could be significant. It's a synchronization type of weight. Okay, the other myth I want to bust out today is what is SOS scheduler yield and what does it mean to my system? Notice this is a forced weight. And what I mean by this is that if a task does not naturally wait on a, a weight on a resource or a sync, like a IO lock or latch type scenario, if you're just running in SQL Server as a worker and you don't wait on something, you are not allowed to run forever. Or you could dominate the system and not allow other workers to run because SQL OS has this non-preemptive scheduling system, a cooperative system. So effectively, what we do is typically if a quantum of four milliseconds is exceeded, this is a typical type of algorithm, we do this yielding inside SQL Server. And if we don't do this right in our code, you may get something like this in your error log, where you have a non-yielding problem. So the way this works is, is that, oh, excuse me, here's some examples. You don't need I.O. for any pages. You just do some T-SQL variable expression calculation. You're in the middle of query compilation or small hashes and sorts. Examples of CPU bound operations that run in SQL Server. So the way this weight type works is, if we do a yield because we're CPU bound, we don't need to wait on something, we use that SOS weight info structure I mentioned earlier, and we pass an SOS scheduler yield to do this work. But here's the key. Whenever inside SQL OS we use this weight type, all we do is go to this runnable list concept in SQL OS. We don't wait on anything. We go to runnable and we wait inside SQL OS because what we're going to do is we're going to switch to somebody else who's runnable, and then we're going to stay in this runnable list for somebody else to tell us we can run. If we go to this runnable list and we're the only person on the scheduler, we are simply going to wake ourselves up and run again. Okay? Therefore, based on what I told you earlier, the wait time for SOS scheduler yield is effectively signal wait time. Because the amount of time that we're waiting on this is simply to be in this runnable state. From runnable to running, from runnable and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Because of this, you're only going to typically see SOS scheduler yield as a last wait type. Let me be very clear about this. You're almost no way can you run a query against our DMVs and see SOS scheduler yield as a wait type because you're never going into this suspended state. You're going directly to runnable to running and back to runnable. Okay? However, if you were an SOS scheduler yield wait and then you waited on a lock, Okay, the last wait type will get set when you wait for the lock, but when you go back to the run, when you go to the running state first, you would see SOS scheduled yield as your wait type. Now here's kind of my advice on seeing this wait type. Number one, if you have a high count of these but a low average weight, it's okay. It's actually probably normal. You probably have a CPU bound type workload or some CPU bound workloads, but that is expected in this case. 
because in CPU bound workloads for SQL Server, we always have to yield while you're running. So if you've got a high count but a low weight, it doesn't matter. It's not usually even a CPU bottleneck that's going on. That's actually a good thing in most cases. If you have a high count though and a high weight, you might have a CPU bound problem. So you have maybe a lot of CPU queries running and competing for scheduling resources, or you use this resource governor CPU cap, which I'll show you in a second. If you have a low count and a high weight, that may be indicative of a different problem. If you're not using resource governor, it could be one of these yielding problems that I've talked about. It could be something like this. Or it could be you have a preemptive workload that's hogging a lot of resources. You're doing something like extended stored procedures or something that requires us to go to this preemptive state, which we'll talk about. And you're losing a lot of CPU. So this is kind of the guidance. Just like CX Packet, SOS Scheduler Yield on its own, just showing up is not a bad thing. And it does not mean you're bottlenecked by CPU. If you have a high count and the, low, the average weight is really, really low, this is normal if you're running CPU type based queries. So let's look at one. Okay, let's get rid of these guys. I'm going to bring up a couple of DMV queries. <clears throat> this is one just to look at exec requests. By the way, if you notice here, I'm cheating. Uh, background tasks uh, can be greater than 50, but in this particular case, I know I'm not going to want to run a workload that does that, so I'm just cheating just because I'm t I don't feel like doing the join. I'm just, you know, lazy here in this particular case. And here is where I'm just going to look specifically at SOS Scheduler Yield, and I'm going to look at the average wait time. And let's just see what this looks like to start with. Notice here that I have some amounts. I don't know if I consider that high, but look at the average wait time is pretty low. I'm going to go ahead and clear it first because I want to show you what happens in this workload here. So I'm going to clear it and it's just nothing in there right now. So let me bring up this uh, one query. And you might find this useful if you don't have examples of queries that are just CPU bound. If you're struggling, like how do I test this and see it myself? This is an example somebody gave me in the product team that it's just pure CPU bound. So if I run this and crank it up, You'll notice here this behavior I've mentioned before. Notice here that SOS Scheduler Yield is a last wait type and not a wait type. It's null. You'll never see it as a wait type. And if I can sit here and run it all day long, I'm just going to see this behavior. If I look at wait stats, notice here that the waiting task count is going up, but the average wait time is like almost nothing, right? I'm actually doing a millisecond count. So who cares? I mean, actually, I'm clearing it. <laughs> Sorry, that's why it looks that way. I was like, why is this going back to one? So notice here that the count is going high, but the average wait time is really low. Who cares? It's, CPU it's a CPU workload, but this is only one guy in my system. So I don't really know if I really care about this. Now, it could be, though, that you see this and you're like, OK, I don't want this query to use a lot of CPU. Maybe it's a huge table scan or something to make a lot of pages. But in my behavior, you're not just running one query in your system. You're running multiple queries. So usually there's some other behavior that's going to occur because of a poorly tuned query that's consuming CPU resources. If you're running by yourself, maybe you don't care. So let's do this. Let's actually create, uh, let's actually run this um, workload I have here. Uh, I've got a little command shell called crank it up. That's going to run a bunch of these guys. Now let's see what looks different here. Now you can see the average wait time start to go up from what it was before and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm only running like, I think, 10 of these or something of that nature. Now I'm running more CPU uh, workers than I have CPUs on my machine. And so they're all competing for scheduling resources at this point right now. And so this is actually going up higher and higher. Maybe I need to look at this. The other thing I want you to notice here is look at this signal wait time versus wait time. It's almost identical. And that is normal for this wait type. Because again, the majority of waiting that we're doing here is just the signaling process. I go to runnable, I get signal to run, and back and forth and back and forth. <coughs> what, it, what does it look like if I use resource governor? thought you might find this interesting. Let me stop him. So in SQL 2012, we had this concept called cap CP, CP percent, which is a true cap of CP percentage on a given pool, and I'm setting it for the default. 
Now, if I set this and I run crank it up, I want you to see what happens to this weight type, this um, weight statistic. It starts really going up higher. It just gets climbs, climbs, and climbs, and climbs, and climbs. Because SQL OS, what it's doing is, it's, it's saying, you're capping CPU, and this is CPU bound workload. I'm going to make you stay on the runnable list longer. That's how we achieve capping of CPU. We actually just make you stay in this runnable state longer than you normally would have. And so if I keep running here, you'll notice this is going to get bigger and bigger and pretty high. So a word of caution is you could be looking at this thinking this is some sort of yielding problem with SQL Server, but you need to double check that nobody has used a CPU cap for Resource Governor. There's actually a perfmon counter called Resource Pool Stats you can use to go see is there been some sort of throttling for a CPU resource. Okay. So there's the basics of SOS scheduler yield. Hopefully that was helpful for you in case you get in the scenario and you look at this and go, you know, okay, it's not necessarily a problem just because I see it, but I do need to pay attention to it because maybe I don't expect a CPU workload or maybe I've got a lot of them competing for CPU resources. <clears throat> Let's talk about thread pool for a second. This is an interesting one. Because I have seen this show up on customer servers before, they do indicate a possible problem. So assume that somebody is logging in, and TDS just means tabular data stream, a, a network protocol we use. If somebody's sending a TDS login packet from an application, here's what happens. The server will receive this packet to do the login. It then creates what's called a task in SQL OS to respond to this login. The next thing it does is it finds an available worker on a scheduler to run the task. If there are no workers on my scheduler available to run my task, I set this thread pool wait type for the task. That is an indication that no workers are available to run my task. When the next available worker is, a, is ready to go, it runs the task and it clears the wait type. So in this login scenario, what I've seen is when there's a high wait time is login timeouts. So if I've got CSS engineers that come to my desk and say, customer's complaining about this really high login timeout problem and I don't think it's a network issue, I actually go look to see, am I seeing a thread pool wait scenario? Now, you can only see thread pool in stats and tasks. Why is that? Because a request from D exec request requires the combination of a task plus a worker. So if you see over here, if I clear the thread pool wait type when I become a request because I have a worker, I'll never see it in the actual request wait type. You'll only see this in OS waiting tasks, for example, or in DM OS wait stats. And from my personal experience, if this becomes a major problem, you probably can't even run a query to look at these DMVs. So you need to run dedicated admin connection typically to see it as a live problem. You might have been polling wait stats or keeping track of it over time. And so therefore, you might have caught it as it becomes an issue before you can't run that query anymore. But typically, to see it live, you need to look at a uh, dedicated admin connection. And then when you do look at it, you're going to find this pending state for tasks in DMOS tasks. You, if you see a bunch of pending tasks, that's an indication that the task, there was no available worker on a scheduler to run your tasks. And in addition, in the DMOS scheduler's DMV, whoops. Sorry. In the DMOS schedules DMV, the work queue count will be greater than zero, and it'll sit there and be at high rates for long periods of time. <clears throat> now, thread pool wait types are just victims, typically, all right? You might see them a little bit in when we ramp up the worker pool. So if you see them in DOMOS wait stats as a fairly small number, don't, don't worry about that. If you see a high number of them with a high average wait time, they're just a victim of something else going on in your system. And the number one thing I see is a long blocking problem. Let's paint this scenario. You have a system to where you have a major blocking outage going on in your server. And almost all the workers are blocked on a resource for some application reason or some application problem. If that occurs and all the workers are consumed waiting on resources, we don't have any workers available to service like a login or something. And so that's where I've seen this show up. And in fact, when I first demonstrated this talk, one of the MVPs in the session thought he had seen this on his system and he ran back to his, you know, get his laptop, logged in to look at some of his stats and found that that's exactly what he had run into, was a long blocking problem causing this type of behavior. 
please don't assume, because you're seeing this, that you need to bump up max worker threads. There may be some tuning scenarios where that does make sense, but in general, that's not what's going on. In general, it's some sort of resource issue that's actually causing this weight type to show up. By the way, the reason I call this a resource weight is because the resource you're waiting on is a worker thread, in this particular case, from a task. What about other I.O. weights? So one of them might be log. And if you look at the way we do logging, we have log buffers in our log cache that we use to write out log records to the file. And there's this log writer background task responsible for pulling these buffers and writing it out to your LDF file. <clears throat> well, when you do a commit transaction, and I'm not speaking of delayed durability in this session, which we've offered as a new feature, but if you don't have that option set on, when you commit a transaction, our job is to go try to flush this log buffer. And so if it takes a long time for a log writer to flush out the, the log buffer for your log records, you'll see this write log wait type, which is a synchronization. It's funny, I call this a synchronization wait type, but it's indicative of a, a potential I.O. bottleneck for logging. If you see write log wait types, just seeing them like other wait types on their own is not an indication of a problem. Because if it takes like the average you know, write time of a transfer to a disk of 10 milliseconds, you're going to have a write log for 10 milliseconds, right? But if you see really high average wait times for write log, there could be a bottleneck on the I.O. device for where you're writing log records. If you see enough of these problems back up, you might have what's called a log buffer wait for other types of queries that need to actually go write data into a log buffer. If we only have some of these log buffers, and if all of them are in use because we can't flush them, it kind of backs up into a victim scenario where other commands might be waiting on that resource. If you have a lot of sort operations that have to spill the disk, and there's a bottleneck on that, you'll see something called an I.O. completion wait. That by itself isn't necessarily a bad thing, because if you do a lot of sorting, we only have so much sort memory, and we have to spill sometimes to disk. But if you see high wait times there, it could indication of a bottleneck on the drive where you've got TempDB, for example. And then we do create database file or backing up reading files. You also can see an async I.O. completion wait. Normally, I don't see those being an issue on, on people's servers, but if you wanted to know what does that mean, it comes from these scenarios. And then finally, if you use VDI-based backup solutions, specifically for snapshot backups, when we use VDI, uh, which is a virtual device interface, uh, a lot of third-party backup vendors use that, we do have a synchronization concept that is involved for snapshot backups because we have to freeze the I.O. or make it quiescent for the database. And you'll see the disk I.O. suspend wait type show up while we're doing the snapshot backup. So if that shows up as a wait type uh, that has high wait times, you need to go look at and find out why is the snapshot backup taking so long on your server. <coughs> Resource semaphore waits. Based on our time here, I have a demonstration here that I'm going to skip, but you can run yourself. Uh, I knew that I might have to skip it. But it's a pretty good script to show you a high sort scenario where you can see these wait types show up. I will stop, though, and show you something in DBCC memory status that I want you to pay attention to for compile. So <clears throat> when we need to do hash and sort operations, we need something called query execution memory or memory grants to run those type of queries. It's memory that we allocate as we execute a query to do a sort or a hash. <clears throat> there's a limit on that, and there's a limit on how many of these can, these can run and how much memory they can take up. We don't want you to run queries on your server that all memory is consumed by sorts and hashes. That would be bad. So we have a gating concept or a semaphore concept to do that. If this wait type resource semaphore shows up, it could be that you have limited memory. There could be a limited amount of memory because of other things. You have too many of them trying to run. Or you have this concept called an overestimated memory grant, where the memory grant is incorrect because you have an estimation problem with your query plans. <clears throat> the clerks, the memory clerks in our system that show up for high usage for this are these right here, query exec and QE reservations. And finally, there's some DMVs to show you, like, am I waiting on a grant, this query resource semaphore, or what kind of grants are going on in my system? So, what I'm trying to tell you, though, is if you see this wait type show up, it is probably due to something going on with sort or hash operations that are consuming too much memory or these other examples. So it is, that is something I would absolutely pay attention to if you see this on your system. 
<coughs> in addition, when we compile a query, we need memory to compile a query. Another example where we just allocate memory to do compilation and then we free the memory back up. So if you see this wait type, you absolutely should pay attention because it's slowing down your ability to compile queries. And, but, but I will ask you this question. When somebody brings up this wait type, I'm asking, why are you compiling so much? So perhaps you see this when you're first building up your plan cache, if you restarted your server a little bit. But after you've got the plan cache fairly warm, if you see this a lot, I may ask you, do you have some sort of compiling problem going on? Are you recompiling your queries unnecessarily? But I will tell you that if you do see this, there could be some other factors that cause the issue. There could be queries that require a lot of compile memory, or, or it could be one of these guys that's consuming a lot of query execution memory that lowers the limit for compile memory. And so I wanted to quickly just show you this part of memory status because this is the only place in the server where you can see this information. There's actually a very good blog post by one of our engineers out of France on how this gateway system works. I did not put a link in there for it. I should have, but you can look this up. We have to switch. Yeah, thank you. So Klaus is my assistant here today because he's reminding me to switch. I should have gone to your talk, Klaus, to remind you, but you probably didn't have this problem. No, I had an apple. <laughs> you had an <laughs> apple, oh man. Okay, Klaus is not my assistant today. <laughs> that was brutal, man. <laughs> okay, so uh, when you go down and look at memory status, you'll see this thing called optimization queue, okay? And this target memory value is a value we use in compilation to decide what is the amount of memory we could use to do compilations? And what we do is we have this concept called gateways. The small gateway has these values. And what this means is we're going to allow 16 queries to run at once, consuming three, about 380K of memory. So if you have queries that compile that need less than 380K, you can run as many as you want on the server. doesn't matter. We'll just let them go unbounded because we don't really care. It doesn't matter how many run. They're not going to accumulate that much memory. But if you need more than that value right there, we're only going to allow 16 at a time. So if you go look at these gateways, and we have a medium and a large as well that gate larger memory usages. What you want to look for is this waiter value. If you see waiters in these gateways at any point in time and consistently, it means you're running into probably this compile type problem. <clears throat> if this target value I mentioned here gets really, really low, this is probably due because of query memory's gotten really high or overall server memory, there's some memory pressure scenario that's caused a problem. And the target memory comes into play when you look at these other gateways, one called medium and one called large. So for example here, for the medium gateway, we only allow four people to run based on this factor. This threshold factor is a value where we calculate that target. I don't have the mathematical formula. I think we've got it documented in our, our blog post. But as the lower the target goes, the less four of these guys can run, and the, lar the big gateway only allows one person. So you, it's really hard for you to tell, am I running a query that, re re that needs a lot of compile memory? But if you're seeing this wait type show up, you can look at these gateways to find out, is it a query that needs a big compilation memory, or is it a bunch of smaller ones that get gated because we just have too many of them running at, the, at one time? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Ten minutes. Because lunch is soon and the cardinal sin of being speaking is to pe make people late for lunch. Okay, let's talk about preemptive waits. So, <clears throat> in our system of SQL OS, in SQL Server, when there's a worker that needs to do something that we have no control over, like a Windows API call or an extended store procedure, those are examples, we must turn them into what's called preemptive because we don't want them to worry about scheduling on this runnable system within SQL OS because we can't control them. So we make, we make them preemptive so we don't even know about them anymore pretty much and Windows gets to preempt them all they want. If we don't do this, you could get this non-yielding problem, especially when you call like Windows API calls. Before SQL 2008, the behavior of this looked like this. When you looked at exec request, it was a status of running, 
and a weight type of null. And so you had no idea what was going on. You would have a query that's running for long periods of time, and you had no idea what was going on. Well, in 2008, we introduced this preemptive weight type concept. So now it looks like this. If this takes a long period of time, you'll be running with this weight type. Now, <clears throat> this is where it gets confusing. This does not mean you're actual waiting. We actually don't know what you're doing. Let's take an extended store procedure as an example. You run an extended store procedure, which I realize is deprecated, but many people still have them. And that extended store procedure does some massive while loop that just spins for CPU cycles. We don't even know you're doing that. We just know you call some DLL that goes and does some work. So we're going to leave you as a status of running, because we don't know if you're waiting or not. We just know you're doing something that we can't control. And so that's why it always looked this way. It'll never say status suspended. It'll always say running with some preemptive, and we'll talk about what that means here to the right. There are some scenarios where you can see this along with a normal wait type. So when we do uh, async network I.O., we actually can go preemptive in some scenarios. So you might see the combination of these. You can see async network I.O. with the last wait type of actually preemptive something. And that's the one scenario where the wait type and the last wait type may not be actually the same. <clears throat> you need to know that these names next to preemptive usually indicate the name of the Windows API call we're making. But in some cases, we collect them together and we just call it a name, and it could be several different API calls that make up this name. Here's some examples. <clears throat> if you see get proc address, that means we're probably calling an extended store procedure. So if you see this immediately and it's high wait times, go find out what extended store procedure is running, and that's the cause of that issue. Here's one that's interesting, write file gather. This is the most common scenario you're going to see for an auto-grow situation. So if you have a long auto-grow that's occurring for, let's say, a transaction log that's happening, you're going to see this OS write file gather show up as a long wait time. And usually what you're going to find is you're going to have some sort of latching problem going with it. That the, that the owner of the latch is waiting on this, and it has a, a latch that everybody else needs. And in fact, I've got that scenario this afternoon in the latch talk I'm going to show you. This lookup account SID, specifically, I see this with domain controller issues. You're trying to log into SQL Server. We need to authenticate your login with the domain controller. If there's a delay or that takes a long period of time, this is the wait type that's going to show up. And then here's one thing for OLADB calls. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, this is the one that can show up with async network I.O. There's some 194 of these. And in many cases, they do correspond to a specific Windows API call that we're doing. Finally, let's talk about extended events and weights. <clears throat> I'm going to show you something here at the very end that I think you'll find useful. I've got, by the way, just real quick, I do have a preemptive wait type scenario for you that you can run after the fact and take a look at the scripts to see kind of an example of what that looks like. So aside from the DMVs, we do have some information and extended events that you might find useful. First of all, any time we do a wait on what we call a normal wait, we will record the wait info event. We'll fire that event in SQL Server. If it's a preemptive wait, we actually use a different wait event for it called wait info external. And the way this works is the fields inside these events will have the wait type, which is a code, but you can look it up in a DMV. We'll have an operational code, which is either the beginning of the wait and the end of the wait. And then finally, a duration. But you'll notice something that's missing here that's really important. The wait resource is not here. So in SQL 2014, for normal waits, we have what's called a wait completed event that's more useful, I think, which includes this data plus the actual wait resource. And that actually can be very useful, especially in the case of a latch type scenario. <clears throat> so let me show you something that you'll find interesting uh, from something we have with SQL Server. Class, I got it this time, even though I'm not running Apple. I remembered. Okay. So in SQL 2012 and later, we have, by default, the system health session. I wonder, oh, here we go. We have the system health session that's written to a file. And if I go pull up the data in that file, I'm not running anything, am I? OK, good. <laughs> And I'm going to sort it by timestamp descending. <clears throat> I'm going to find some interesting information. Let me scroll down first and show you a wait. 
I can find that. I'll sort it this way first so I can just go down here. So here's an example. By default, we are going to record in here weights that take a certain amount of time. I believe the duration is like 15 seconds. So if you have any waiting for like 15 seconds for a weight, you're going to see the wait type show up, uh, show up in system health session. So long running waits or long preemptive waits by default can be seen just by looking at the system health data. In addition, remember I told you that DMOS wait stats are not saved uh, because they're in memory, right? Well, by default in the system health session, every five minutes we record this SP server diagnostic component result set. And as part of this, in these query processing uh, XML data, you can double click this. And what we're going to show you is we're going to show you the top weights in the system that are going on at any point in time. Every five minutes, we're actually collecting the top weights by count and by duration. And then also for preemptive weights for, by count and duration. This is extremely useful. You can go to any SQL server, and by default, in a file, we're recording your top weights, OS weight step type weights, uh, by count and duration every five minutes. And so if you had a scenario where you're having a problem and you just don't have any data collected, you might even just bring up the system health session and go immediately look at this and say, am I seeing a lot of async network I.O. or thread pools or whatever type of weight type that could be because of a problem in your SQL server? The system health session is available before 2012, but it's written to a memory buffer only, and it doesn't include this SP server diagnostic weight uh, information. So I think that's extremely useful, and in fact, if you contact me, I'm going to probably ask you to go take a look at that to see if there's a problem. <laughs> and then also, um, in X event, or extended events, there's also a latch suspended event. So if you wanted to have a specific tracking of latches that are going on, latch weights, you could use that event. I have some great resources for you here, including different types of weight stats. Uh, our blog includes information about that. I have a blog about the system health session. There's some white papers where people have gone out from like the CAT team and done some uh, interesting um, theories about how you can just use weight stats to actually go through and troubleshoot an application or use extended events to go through and troubleshoot what queries are consuming the most weight types. Uh, so we're right here near the time for our break for, for your next session. Let me stop and see if you have any questions uh, that I can answer for you. Anybody want to try to stump me or something? Or <laughs> You probably can. Did you find this information useful, helpful? OK. Well, that's good. That's good to know. I get worried when people have no questions, because either means you had no idea what I was talking about, or it's like it's boring to you, or you're afraid to ask a question, maybe. So, OK, so this afternoon, uh, you can expect a much deeper dive specifically into latches. Lots of use of the debugger and looking at the various things of what a latch is and how we use it in detail. So that's a little bit of a more deeper session, if that's what you like. I'll be doing that this afternoon. I appreciate your time today. Enjoy the rest of the conference today. Thank you very much.